Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. So, mm -hmm. you know, from that age, I started to figure out, okay, there's things I can do to be seen and to get that attention and not get in trouble. So I started to sort of play around with, um, you know, how hard I could tackle, how hard I could run, uh, just more or less being a menace. And year after year, I would step it up and step it up that little bit more just to be seen. Um, and I think everything just that if there was a turning point where I left that little boy behind that just wanted to be left alone and wanted to play and be a kid, it was it would have to be around that moment. Yeah. What what made you feel that you weren't seen to begin with? Uh, hmm. I, I guess coming from a big family, so I'm one of 10. And oh, wow. so, you know, when you come from a big family like that, it's, um, it, it's hard to get the attention of your parents or to have that one-on-one -on -one time really. And I didn't really think of it growing up. But, you know, as I, as I got older and started having a family, for me, it was like, I don't want to have too big of a family because what myself and my son have, and we had that one-on-one -on -one time, is, is so special and sacred that it's important that other children in your family have that. And I didn't have that with, with my, um, my parents growing up. So I, I, I wasn't seen through their eyes in that sense. Like, they saw me. They didn't understand yeah. me. They didn't see me. They didn't get to know me. I was there. I was, and, and that's what it felt like when I reflect yeah. back on those days. Yeah. You lived a very adult life quite young, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Where do we begin with that? Um, yeah. So I'm the, I'm the th third youngest, but um, so myself and my two younger brothers, there's, there's a bit of an, an age gap with um, other siblings, but I sort of always had that role of looking after my younger brothers, making sure they were okay. Um, so having that responsibility, uh, I, I guess I had to grow up pretty quick. I had a responsibility to make sure my little brothers were um, were good, you know, that uh, it, it was my job to make sure that they were on time or they were looked after, that they were picked up after or things like that. So um, growing up fast, I think it's, it's normal in big families. It's very normal in Polynesian families too, where we take on big responsibilities to help yeah. out our family. Um, you know, if I, if I jump ahead to my teenage years, I was already nightclubbing when I was like 15, 16 years old. You know what I mean? Like by the time I yeah. turned 18, I was over nightclubbing and people my age were just starting and thinking, this is awesome. And I was like, yeah, no, I've been there, done that. Like what else can we do? <laughs> yeah. Cause you were doing quite a few things when you were younger as well. I mean, are you happy to talk about the, some of the other things that you were doing that we'd previously spoke about? You you, mm. you you did some very adult things in the teenage years that I know didn't enter my head. You know, I come from Manchester. Manchester's not the, the nicest place on the planet. I mean, I, I love Manchester, don't get me wrong, but you know, it was pretty rough uh, in the area I grew up in. Um, but these some of these things that you did didn't enter my head. I'm sure some people were doing it. Maybe I was blocked off from it. I don't know. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. What did you what do you what did you get up to there? Oh, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Andy. Was, uh, all kids were doing at that age. Well, I, uh, I mean, you, you actually, I mean, things yeah. like drugs. Um, yeah, you're doing that pretty young. I, I don't mean hard drugs. You know, the 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 the, the yeah. good old. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, is that okay to say? Yeah, no, that's fine. I um, I started drinking when I was eleven. Yeah. Um, just because I mean, yeah, 
where does that come from drinking at 11? Where do you, where do you see a beer at 11 years old? You know, I'm trying to yeah, figure yeah. out well, where you, you know, would... Our family would always have like weekend barbecues and, you know, being that youngster looking and watching them, they were always laughing, having a good time and, and having that responsibility with my younger brothers and stuff I'd done around the house, you know, the amount of chores yeah. I had and stuff like that. I almost was like, you know what? I feel old enough to be having a drink with them fellas. Um, so I just remember one of my best mates, we had to go to our year. Well, yes, yes. Yeah, we're going to some orientation for, for school, um, for high school the following year. So we're still 11 uh, and we decided to steal some some drinks to drink on the way to our school orientation. Uh, and everything sort of started from there. It's like, that tastes like crap. This tastes all right. Uh, what have you got? <laughs> and, um, you know, it just seemed like the natural thing to do because the adults around us were doing it. They looked like they were fine and they were enjoying it and having a good time. So yeah. it all sort of stemmed from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I could get that. I could see why you would think that, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, so you, you were brought up with that warrior mentality. Um, you had that warrior mentality. Did that warrior mentality ever come up as a, as a in your demeanor, your actions, what you did in your, in your life? Did that ever come out? Yeah, a lot, a lot. So from that time where I uppercutted that kid when I was like seven, eight years old and mm you know, coming to that realization of, you know, this is what I've got to do to be seen. I just, that warrior mentality became a big part of my life. It's like, I was looking for fights. I wanted to fight. I wanted to prove myself. Um, so I was getting in lots of fights often too. My upbringing with my father meant that we were training a lot, sometimes twice a day. You know, like when my father worked away, I had the biggest break, you know what I mean? But I still had to make sure I was training myself and my two younger brothers because when my dad got home, it was like a fitness test. Um, and when my dad was working locally, we would be playing out front like normal kids. And then as soon as he sort of drives past a slow ass drive by, he would make eye contact and point at home. And then it would just be like, oh, sorry, i got to go. And, wow. you know, that was just the norm. Like, we'd go home, get changed, and we'd be training. It'd be, like, martial arts training or we'd be running laps at the park, sprint training, tackle practice. You know, we were very fit kids growing up. But, um, uh, yeah, it's that warrior very... mentality and the upbringing I had, it, it also instilled a very big mental toughness because... I remember sometimes I'd be running laps and I'd be crying and I wasn't allowed to stop. I had to hit my numbers. I had to keep going. It was just like, suck it up. What's taking you so long? Let's go. So, you know, wow. in a sense, I look back at that and I'm like, okay, well, that helped me with my mindset that I could achieve anything because I've had to push past some pretty big barriers in my childhood. But all that did was make me angrier. And that anger, mm -hmm. luckily, I was playing rugby because I got to let that anger had that outlet in rugby. But I, at the same time, it's like, I feel sorry for whoever's on that team because I've come to kill today. And, yeah. you know, I got that reputation around around Perth and, and the rep teams is that there's a guy on the field and he's going to try to take your head off. And that was me. It was, it was like my way of like, cool, oh, I get to hurt someone today. Like, bring it on. Like, just you point and I'm going to destroy them. And... Did you did you enjoy having that reputation around Perth? Yeah, I'm said it's um, it's what growing up I didn't know until I got older was that I thrived on people fearing me. It was just part of my identity. It's like if you're gonna know me, you're gonna fear me. I'm gonna intimidate the shit out of you, and I'm gonna make you small, and I'm gonna make sure that you know. I'm the boss, what I say goes. 
And when we're on the field, I'm going to dominate you. And it's just, it was all fear-based. And I guess, because that's what I felt growing up. It's like, you know, it's exactly what it was like with me and my father's relationship. The older men in my lives, whether it's older cousins, uncles, just older relative male figures, they were all feared. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's just what I believed had to be done. It's like, you fear me. And that's just the way it's meant to be. It's either you fear or, you, or you're the one who, who's obviously, um, you know, the, the weak one that's, that's fearing someone else. So, yeah. So with that then, did you feel, were you, uh, did you feel fear growing up then? Were you scared of the people you were looking up to or supposed to look up to? The only person I've ever feared is my father. Right. Yeah. And he, he always had a saying, even ways. with my older siblings, his, his saying was, the day that you can beat me in a fight is the day that I'll give you that respect that you want and the day that you can do whatever you want in my household. But there was... Did that know, day ever come? That, one of my older brothers, I, I was young, but I heard that he tried um, back in the days and my dad... Yeah, he didn't. He didn't get there. <laughs> wow, I couldn't even imagine that. Um, you said many people feared you on the rugby field. Did that cross to normal to normal life in society, school, work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely school. Uh, I've been suspended and expelled out of numerous schools, high schools mostly um because in high school that teenage years is where I, I really stepped into that warrior mentality and it's where i got a lot of attention for being that strong guy or you know i'm not sure what it was like where you grew up but when there was a fight everyone would run to the fight and be um trying to you know see what's going on and mm. most of the time it was me fighting and because I, the upbringing I had with the the martial arts and my fitness training and everything like that, it's it just all went hand in hand where I'd get into a fight and I was always the one that was victorious because I'd be, I'd be training twice a day for that shit. You know what I mean? Like No one else had so, that edge, did they? No, nah, not really. Like they think they did, not knowing what my background was. And, you know, I was always all fighting older kids. Um, one of the high schools I got asked to leave from, I was year nine fighting year 12s, you know what I mean? Um, myself and my older brother, um, you know, we had a lot of patience, but we went to this new private school because we were asked to leave from our previous schools for fighting. And... Um, you know, we, we wanted to make this work for our parents and we would always come home. It just got to a point, we were the only dark kids in the school. Um, and just a lot of stuff was being written on walls and we knew who it was. There's was was always that one clicky group just writing that, you know, LJ sucks his brother's blah, 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 or LJ, or his, you know, LJ's brother, um, you know, have intercourse, have, you know, all the way they, they, and they oh, just try to give it to us and not knowing like actually what we're capable of, you know, like yeah. it's probably just rich sport kids or, or whatever. And we'd go home and it'd just be like, oh, we found this on the walls, we're doing that. And, you know, our mum would try to do the right thing and say, oh, look, our son's uh, experiencing this. Can you please look into it? And it just got to a point and we're at the dinner table and my mom was like, well, I guess you better do something about it. And we sort of looked up from eating and then we looked at our father and he didn't say anything. Then we looked back at our mom and she was like, well, you've taken it for this long and it doesn't sound like anything's going to change. So I'll leave it to you. So, wow. you know, and having that blessing from our matriarch, our mom, who's like the loveliest person in the world, he doesn't have like a violent streak in there at all. It's like, all right, we aren't like tomorrow's yeah. the day. Let's plan this out. And, you know, we, we just went in, did what we had to do. And 
you know, here where I was, year nine, knocking out year 12s, thinking that just because we were younger, that, you know, they had power over us. And, yeah, that that's just part of my childhood. Like, they didn't so understand that, that occasion my, where... my upbringing had me ready for that stuff. Like, yeah, you know, they didn't so... stand a chance. No, clearly. Uh, I mean, I mean, look, jokes. Are, well, it's kind of a joke, but the year twelve losing out to a year nine—that's quite embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, go to a child's mentality, a, a teenager's mentality, when you're losing to somebody three years younger than you—that's that's gonna that's gonna put a dent in the old woodwork, isn't it? You know. Oh, um, sure. What you said, you planned it out. What you and your brother would plan? Um, I mean, I'm sh what did that plan look like for that particular day in that particular scenario? What? How did that? Well, I wouldn't say if it was like covert stuff. It was like, okay, well, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it at recess. This is where they sit. So, what we'll do is we'll go confront them at recess, and if they want to go us, then we'll go. So we, you know, it's, you know, that's as far as planning went for. Oh yeah, a couple yeah. of young kids, but yeah, it wasn't, you know, wasn't in think intricate or. <laughs> Or yeah, know, like FBI very style. Cool. Yeah, it was just like, okay, we have recess at this time. They sit here. We'll go confront them, and if they retaliate back, then we'll go at it. Wow, well, yeah, that's so. If I ran, if I ran up to that part of the field, let's say, was it on the field? If I ran up to you and watched you in a fight in the field, how would it look? Would it would it be would it be kicks? Would it be punches to the face? Nah. How would they look once you'd finish? We were never allowed to kick. Like that was like oh. one of my father's big rules uh, when we're oh. we'll be fighting in the backyard. It's like when someone's on the ground, then it's over. Um, so if more or less if you blinked, you missed it. You know what I mean? Like because we had that that power and we had that technique where it's like we only needed one or two punches, and the other person, mm -hmm. if they're not on the ground already, they're pretty quick to be like, "I'm done." So. Um, yeah, always punches, never any kicks. Uh, so yeah, it's, I guess for the upbringing we had, there was still sort of rules of engagement. Yeah. In a way, there sounds like a bit of respect there when that victim is down and out, you walk away and you don't carry on. Yeah. How, how do you even switch that off? You're angry. You're in the moment. How do you stay it's, disciplined in that? It, it's just something that's just drummed into you. Um, so it's it's not something that you have to think about when when you're training okay. so often and you know say myself and my brother are, are aspiring each other and one of us falls to the ground it's just like okay give them give them their space until they get mm -hmm. back up and say they're ready to go so it's it's just part of your second nature oh they're down okay wait and it's just something my dad's always told us it's like when someone's down you don't kick them if someone's down there it's over take your steps back so you, you're in a safe space that you're not yeah. in you know close proximity that they can try something dirty it's just make sure you know you're in a safe spot and if make sure that they're done if just say if you had enough if you haven't had yeah. enough then stand up let's go again and would any of these people in year 12 or the older kids in high school um, ever fight back or was it n didn't ever go that far? They, they, they got the option to. They tried fighting back, but it's just they didn't have a chance. You know what I mean? Like, even though I was three years younger, I was still stronger and tougher than my brother that was two years older than me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's it, it did, age didn't really matter. It's. I've I've always had a way. I really took it on board with our our fight training. Like I remember, my older brother would always hold the mitts. So I have a brother, older brothers that are like um, fourteen, fifteen years older than us, older than myself anyway. And they had um, upbringings in martial arts. So if my dad was working away, my older brothers had to come over and train us. So I just always remember remembering one of my older brothers saying, "You're going to gas yourself out." like pace yourself you don't have to hit the pads hard every single punch but in my head i'm like screw that every punch 110 percent, and i'll go this whole three minute round whatever it's got to take and wow. so i i really just 
took that mentality on like i'm a beast i'm a beast i'm a beast like i won't be beaten so every punch was 110 percent um so yeah it's... the 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 this happened in school did any of this happen outside of school as well did it go into into the communities yeah yeah always oh. always where we grew up there was always little gangs and stuff and and because of that, you know, I don't know what it's like these days because of the internet and social media, but the area we grew up in was pretty rough, you know, like it was one of the worst suburbs in whole of Australia when I was when I was growing up when it comes to violence. So there was lots of little gangs around. And when we moved here, there wasn't many many Maoris or Polynesians over here. So a lot of people thought that we were Aboriginal, but we looked different. And then we sort yeah. of explained to them that we're Polynesian, Samoan heritage. They're like, okay, where's that? Um, so, you know, that in itself was different for other people because we looked a bit different. Um, so, you know, on weekends, gangs would get together, would fight, would hear of other things. And, yeah, we were always meeting up at places with other rival gangs just to have all in brawls or, you know, would two other people would have a beef. So, you know, there'd be like 50, 100 kids on the school oval watching two people fight, but then it becomes something else. Or, you know, you're, you're waiting there at a park with your crew, then the other crew rocks up and then they've got weapons and stuff on them. And then we're like, okay, what can we use? So we try to use our school bags or or whatever we can to sort of protect ourselves so we can disarm them enough to to make sure we win the fight. So it's it was a whole childhood of it, you know, and that went into if I, I actually remember it just come to me then. Wow, oh, I had a rugby grand final. And the night before the rugby grand final I was like, I'm staying in, I'm gonna have a good night's sleep, I've got my finals tomorrow and I'll make sure I'm well rested. And um, I had my phone on me. Uh, yeah, mobile phones just come out. You've got those big ass phones. And uh, yeah. because I was going to a school up in the city, my parents got me a phone so I could they could at least contact me. And my phone started ringing. And it was one of my mates. I can't remember what time it was, but he was like, we just got jumped. We're at the address. We need you. We're going to, can we come pick you up? And I was like, I've got my finals, man. Like. They're like, bro, we need you. And I was like, okay, well, I was like, all right, pick me up out front. What do we need? They were like, whatever you got. And back then, my teenage days, we would, I would always, if I walked past a, a trolley and it was like in a park, I would jump on it until the trolley pole come out. So we, I had like a whole cupboard, maybe like 20 poles. I'd just been collecting because I thought, what the hell, one day I might need this. So the boys pulled up and I dropped all the poles into the, the boot and then we took off and then we got to this house where there was sort of these people were hiding out and I just grabbed two poles and they wouldn't come out. So I just started being real destructive in front of the house and breaking, smashing anything that I could get my hands on. Um, and that was just like a normal thing. But also when I reflect back on that right now, it's like, fear me because I'm going to destroy you. It's it's whatever you bring to the table, expect me to go 10 times worse. And, you know, maybe that's why I had the tendency to win because I was always prepared to go that extra bit of distance that I needed to. Either yeah. you're going to crumble because of fear or I'm going to crumble you with my fist. So you've got to choose, like, which one is it? I, underst I understand that, uh, that pushing mentality based on you as training. It's the emotional side for me. You had no emotion to that scenario for your, the people who came and picked you up in the car because you, you were focused on your rugby final. But then you approached the house and you let loose. How did you, turn, how did you grow up just being able to turn that emotion on? Because you've never seen this house before. You don't know who was behind. All you know is the people you're supporting. How do you switch that emotion to to be 
that aggressor in that moment. Do you know what I mean? To be honest, it's it's not switching on an emotion. It's switching off your emotions. Uh, yeah, it's a good good way of looking at it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 putting on that cold hard face. It you, you can't have emotions in that moment. Mm. Emotions make you hesitate, and hesitation. Mm. I was never allowed to hesitate. That was a big thing of my father's. Um, what he would always say to us every training session, everything we're doing, never hesitate. Never hesitate. Never hesitate. If you hesitate, you die. If you hesitate, the other person will get the other hand. So through my training and my upbringing, I learned to turn everything off because the less I felt, the more I could do. So having those emotions in that moment, or even growing up, like I turned off a lot of my emotions. So my hard, the hardest part was turning those emotions back on. And when I decided to change myself, a lot of my transformation was trying to find where those emotions were hiding. Like having kids is sort of, having kids really helped me find a lot of my emotions because that's when I started to feel again. So I had to allow myself to not be afraid of these feelings because they felt so new and so raw that my first instinct was to push it away. But lucky enough that I was on that journey and I knew that if I wanted to have the relationship that I wish I had with my father, then I needed to feel this. I needed to understand what it was, what it's called. Otherwise, I would always turn off these emo emotions and my son wouldn't actually get the real me. He would get surface level me. So. Yeah, yeah, no emotions. Can't afford to have emotions in that moment. To have a clear head, yeah, well. I had to not think. It's like, just do. If needed, could you do that now? Yeah. What do you think you're capable of doing now? It's, um, if it came down to it, I could turn that off. But that scares me more than anything to go back, mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to do that. Cause I've done so much work to get to where I am, but you know, that's my early childhood. That's what was first conditioned into me. So it's not something that you can get rid of, but it's something that I have to live with. And it's the awareness that I need to have of, is that person starting to come up now? Do I need to remove myself from this situation? Um, you, yeah. You you mentioned earlier the pivotal part was the last 10 years, that transformation, the same people, you weren't the same, you and Sherelle were not the same person, uh, people as you were 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, have you ever felt that old you rising up inside your soul, would you say? Yeah. Not necessarily definitely. surface, surface, but have you ever yeah. felt him? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Or how? It's um, conflict. When conflict's happening, that's where it's um, that's where I start to feel him coming. It's where I start to feel yeah. that he's preparing himself to make an appearance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure we'll go over some of those scenarios. Um, but going back to where we're currently at school. Uh, adolescence were you a dangerous person would you say we would you have considered yourself a, a dangerous person only if you were on the wrong side of me um how only then. a dangerous person if somebody was on the wrong side of you because because i, I was able to to switch off and be violent without caring it's you hurt someone that's near to me i'm going to hurt you so in that aspect i was a very dangerous person but at the same time i wasn't openly picking on just anyone and everyone hmm. 
I was always looking for that challenge, if that makes sense. It's like, yeah. why would I pick on that person who I could probably finish off with just my pinky? Like, it serves me no no right. Like, it, it for me, it's like, who can who can challenge me? And who mm. deserves this? Did you ever land on the wrong side of the law? because of the person you were yeah yeah i have um luckily that um you know things went my way um i guess when the law got involved it was it was more so to it was always like the third party like never the people that was actually involved when there were like big gang fights or, you know, scheduled one-on-one -on -one fights. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, I'm very lucky to have stayed out of trouble in that sense. Like, yes, the law was involved, but I was, I never done time. I never had to go. I always tried to be smart about these things, like hmm. how I fought, where I fought. Did it, did anyone in your family ever do time? um no no not that i'm aware of yeah yeah mm. it's um it, i guess our impulse for for violence was always waiting to protect or waiting to be started on you know like because we were always ready to finish things it's wasn't openly going out trying to just create a ruckus for the sake of a ruckus where it's it's more like you know in clubs i'd make eye contact with another big guy because we were always taller than the rest i sort of knew i was like okay this guy wants to go so it's like you know you sort of just look at each other and then it's like want to go you want to go and it's like okay let's go and then so it was always that silent agreement of like okay yeah it's gonna happen let's do this so yeah, wow. yeah, I guess I'm lucky in that sense. So when that would happen in the in the club, you know, I've experienced that, but not quite like you guys. I'm not as clearly as big as you. I'm a basketball player, but I'm not a big basketball player. <laughs> um, you know, when you would look at somebody like that, would the fight happen there? Or is it kind of a silent agreement? Uh, we're we're going to take this outside. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.